Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Board of Directors agenda meeting for October 11th, uh, 2016. This is an opportunity for us to uh, set the agenda for our upcoming meeting on the 18th and to uh, discuss any other relevant uh, information among board members that we may wish to uh, um, uh, bring to uh, our staff's attention. So with that said, the first item uh, is with our city manager. So I'll move to our second item which is, um, this is Hispanic Heritage Month, and there's a proclamation that I've issued which I'd like to ask uh, uh, City Director uh, Gene Fortson to present. Director Adcock? Director Fortson? What did I say? Excuse me, Director Fortson. Did I say Adcock? I apologize. <laughs> I, 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 I need to get more sleep, I think. <laughs> yeah, Director Fortson. I looked over at Gene and said, Adcock, I don't know what that's about. Go I've ahead. been called much worse. That's, that's true. That, that was actually a compliment, that's Director a compliment. Forsen. That's right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the board. As some of you may know, September 15th through October 15th is recognized as Hispanic Heritage Month nationwide. And this afternoon, we see this same designation as Hispanic Heritage Month for the city of Little Rock as well. In doing so, we recognize the significant contribution that Hispanic individuals have made to the economic, social, and cultural fabric of our city. Individuals like Alex Gukum, who is a recognized, renowned local sushi chef who came to the U.S. from El Salvador at age 16 to take a job washing dishes. He spent years working his way up through the restaurant industry and is now an executive chef. He and his young family are active in the civic affairs of Little Rock and understand he's not able to be with us this afternoon. Other individuals like Gilbert Aquinez, is, is Gilbert here? He's on his way. He's on his way, I think, uh, who he was slated to be here today, is executive chef at the Clinton Presidential Center and another story of success from the Hispanic contributions in our restaurant industry. He formerly served as executive chef at the Arkansas Governor's Mansion and he originally came from San Antonio to Little Rock and worked his way up since starting at a dishwasher at age 16. And I have this proclamation as the mayor uh, indicated. Uh, and, uh, Director Webb asked me to represent her in presenting it since she could not be here today. And what this says is uh, proclamation, know ye all people by these presents greetings, whereas September 15th through October 15th has been declared National Hispanic Heritage Month to honor the role that Hispanics have played in cultural and continue to play in the cultural and commercial life in the city of Little Rock. And whereas Hispanics make up a significant portion of the labor force, workers as elected officials, CEOs, small business owners, entrepreneurs, and homemakers who provide leadership, guidance, and support of the values which strengthen our economy. And whereas Hispanics in the city of Little Rock are exceptional role models in the professional and have distinguished as professionals and have distinguished themselves as community leaders and business owners, creating jobs, paying wages, and demonstrating that they are a positive force in our local communities and neighborhood. Whereas we celebrate the unique influence of the Hispanic cultures in our city and our state and our society and recognize that when Hispanics succeed, our nation, state, and city succeed. Now therefore, we do proclaim this period of time, September 15th through October 15th, 2016, as Hispanic Heritage Month, the City of Little Rock, to recognize the many accomplishments and contributions made by the Hispanics who live in our city, state, and nation. And uh, I suppose I'll give this to you, Amanda, to hold for Mr. Aquinez, who could not make it here, and I'm sorry he wasn't here for the presentation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Director Fortson. Uh, the next item we have um, um, is um, one of those bittersweet retirements that we have. Uh, you'll note on your, um, uh, in front of you, you've got an, the 2015 annual report of the Little Rock Zoo, which I think is appropriate. And I know we recently went through an accreditation that was very successful. But um, uh, we've got an announcement today, and I'm going to ask our city manager, Bruce Moore, to uh, um, Brief us on uh, an impending employee retirement. Thank you, Mayor, members of the board, and uh, the 
think it's very appropriate that uh, the staff handed, has handed out the annual report uh, from the zoo because you can really see under Mike's leadership uh, how we have grown uh, since he's been here. Uh, so it is, you're, you're right, it is uh, bittersweet for us uh, at this point, but he, he leaves the zoo in a, in a great place. And uh, with that, Mike has served uh, uh, 17 years with the city. Uh, awards and honors include Speaker of the Year in the International Association of Business Communications. He won the Sustain the Rock Sustainability Award in 2016, the Arkansas Recycling Coalition Government Recycler of the Year Award, and as the mayor mentioned, he, we've maintained our AZA accreditation since 2001 under his leadership. Uh, according to Mike, his favorite uh, memory of the city, there's really too many to list. It, but working side by side with the staff will always resonate in my heart and mind. The grand opening of any exhibit is always special, and I have many fond memories of opening exhibits such as the penguin exhibit and the, and the cheetah exhibit. His plans uh, for retirement include taking it easy and relocating uh, back to the West Coast, uh, back home. So at this time, let me uh, ask uh, Mike to come forward. I have a plaque to present. He even dressed up and wore a tie. I just did. <laughs> Wanted to put sleeves on. <laughs> Mike, uh, Mayor Mark Stoller, Little Rock City Board of Directors, and uh, myself express their deep and heartfelt gratitude to you for your dedicated service to the citizens of Little Rock as director of the Little Rock Zoo from 1999 through 2016. Your dedication, determination, and dependability have been key as Little Rock Zoo has achieved great success and embarked on new programs and projects. The care of animals, amenities for visitors, and education opportunities have all improved during your directorship. Your leadership has brought national recognition to the women and men of the Little Rock Zoo and to the city of Little Rock, October 2016. Congratulations. Great. Thank you. It's going to make me cry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, directors, Bruce, James. Um, it was about 17 years ago when uh, Nancy and I and our, my children came here uh, to be introduced hey, to Nancy. the uh, board. And I'll, talk, I'll introduce her in just a second. So a lot has happened during that period of time. And a lot of, you know, I'd certainly I get recognized for this, but as you all know so well, there are so many people that have made this uh, a success. And uh, really, the Little Rock Zoo is a great zoo now. Something you all can be proud of. Uh, I'm proud of it. And um, so I think it just needs your continued support. I would like to recognize Nancy, my wife of 33 years. We met back at the camp. Yeah, come on, stand up. Uh, <laughs> we met, uh, she was a docent, one of the volunteers at the Little, uh, Kansas City Zoo, and I was the mammal curator. And, and so she's been part of my zoo career from the very beginning. You met her at the zoo, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I really want to, uh, again, you see a, a product here, J.J. Mulehausen, Susan did the uh, end report, it's great, but the zoo staff, it's a fantastic group of people dedicated to the conservation of uh, wildlife, and that's what you need for a zoo, and it's a great group of people. Along with that are the docents, the volunteers, I have to do that since Nancy's here, and a couple of other docents, too, but docents are a big one. Um, Certainly the, uh, the Board of Governors and the Foundation have been uh, remarkable supporters of the zoo. And then the Board of Directors, you people have really given us the resources we need uh, to be as successful as we had. And I, I can't thank you enough for that. I'd like to appreciate you. And uh, there's one individual. Uh, he wasn't supposed to be here today. You know, but uh, he has been really uh, a real benefit, help, leader, uh, supporter, contributor to and that's Brad Cazort. And I uh, can't thank you enough. Brad, that's great. So uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, I'm going to take, take it easy, move back to the Northwest, which is my home, our home. And uh, really looking forward to, uh, to doing that. You know, all I have to do is kind of look at uh, some slides of uh, where we want to go and say, yeah, this is the right time to do this. So. Again, thank you very much for all the support you've given, not only me and the zoo, 
uh, with the people of Little Rock. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> Director Cazort. Director Cazort, you're recognized, please. Thank you, Mayor. And Mike did say correctly, we have a great zoo right now. And, and I think like any zoo, as great as it is, it's always a work in progress and uh, will always be improving. But I just want to remind everybody where we were 17 years ago when Mike came. We had lost our accreditation. We had lost our USDA license. Uh, this zoo was in very close to, to closing and providing a lot of uh, vacant real estate in prime part of town because uh, it was in bad shape. And we have gotten accredited, gotten all our licenses back, and become, I think, a world-class zoo uh, under Mike's leadership. And, and I don't know that we'd be there if not for him. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mike, it's a wonderful amenity. Uh, thank you for uh, your professionalism and, and bringing that to Little Rock. and. Uh, the West Coast. Whereabouts on the West Coast are you relocating? Uh, Nancy's the one kind of taking the lead there. We looked at places like Astoria, which is at the mouth of the Columbia River. If you watched the movie Goonies, hey, that's Astoria. Uh, or uh, Coos Bay, which is at the southern yeah. end of the coast, somewhere along in there. So, uh, But, uh, you know, it really gives us the opportunity to, to investigate that and pick the right spot. So. We're looking forward to doing that. Well, best of luck to, to you and your family, and thank you so much for your dedication to the city of Little Rock. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, that concludes our um, uh, presents, uh, presentations um, uh, for today, and we can now move on to the consent agenda items one through seven. Let me ask board members whether you have any questions about any of those. Uh, yes, Director Wright. On uh, resolution number one, I'd like a presentation from staff on this. It's just to set the date. Yeah, I've heard some from, from some of my constituents, and they they are uh, opposed to this, and I was just wondering what the – but I guess they could wait until then. Typically, we just are setting the dates on yeah. these, and then we'll have the presentation. Okay. If that's okay, Director yeah, that'll Wright. Be that'll be All fine. right. And then that's the same with uh, item two. We're just setting a date. Are there any other questions on uh, resolutions one through seven? Uh, Director Cazort. No, I'm waiting for the next items, Mayor. Uh, okay, we can move to, uh, we can now move to the planning and development items, items eight through 14. Um, uh, Director Cazort wished to have a presentation on item 10, and then Director Wright would like a presentation on item eight. Mr. Bozinski. We want to take them in numerical order or? <laughs> Doesn't make any difference, Corp. Let's go number eight and then number 10. I saw him, he's late. Item eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Director Wright. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the board, item eight is one of the out parcels at Shackelford Crossings. And the request is to revise the plan development to allow additional signage on this uh, restaurant that's proposed for, um, like I said, one of the out parcels. Again, it's just to add a third wall sign on this property. Which parcel? Which parcel? I hadn't seen anything under construction. Has it not started yet? Uh, or is it, it finished? No, it, it has not started yet. Okay. Then. It's the one remaining vacant uh, out parcel there along Shackelford Road. Okay. And no, there, were, there was no uh, op opposition to this? It was on the consent agenda. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, direct, um, if you'd go to item 10, please, for uh, Director Gazort. Sure. Uh, Director Gazort, Vice Mayor, Mayor, members of the board, item 10 is properly located on 12,400 Cantrell Road. This is on the north side of Cantrell, west of uh, the South Ridge, Pleasant Ridge intersection. 
and the request is to rezone approximately three acres from R2 single fam, no, excuse me, this one's 03 general office to uh, plan commercial development to allow a, a single building, approximately 14,000 square feet in size for a mix of uses. The primary use will be a personal training studio, a health spa, and then a florist and then additional space will be set aside for office uses. Uh, this item was on the consent agenda at the Planning Commission. It was a unanimous vote by the Commission of 10 I's, zero no's. Uh, it complies with the Highway 10 design overlay district. And again, we, there were no issues that were raised. Specifically where on Highway 10 is this one? Director Cazort, it's directly west of the uh, Substa the substation that's on the north side of Highway 10. That, um, uh, Director Weirich, uh, you're recognized for a question. Okay, mine is on, uh, I'd like a presentation on 13. 13? Uh -huh. yes, Item 13, please, Tony. Uh, Director Weirich, item 13 is properly located at 9201 Stagecoach Road and is currently zoned R2 single family and the request is uh, to reclassify to plan commercial development to allow uh, auto zone uh, store and then um, C3 uses if auto zone doesn't happen. The property is shown on the land use plan as mixed use. It's adjacent to non-residential uses on the uh, north and south. Again, this was on the consent agenda at the Planning Commission, and it was a 10-0 vote by the Planning Commission to recommend approval. Uh, to the north is a family dollar store. To the south is a, a restaurant, and then um, as you can see, the future land use plan recommends um, a non-residential pattern along this section of stagecoach on both sides. Okay. Um, there's a sort of a rundown home that's there now, and when I looked at the information from the planning uh, documents, it looked like that uh, we were putting in quite a bit of landscape. and. Um, thing that was confusing to me a little bit and maybe you just cleared it up for me it looked like um maybe there were some more parcels on this piece of property or is it just that if the auto zone doesn't go in there then it's already zoned for commercial type uses that's correct um, a lot of times director wyrick when they go when they request a plan development they'll have a primary use but then they'll ask for a certain uh, group of uses that are allowed in a particular zoning district. Okay. O3 three in this case, they're asking for C3 general okay. commercial. So it is use. just one one commercial yes. property. Okay. I would like to leave this separate. I've kind of gotten mixed reviews in the community. There are some people that are for it and some people that are um, adamantly against it. So I'd like to leave it separate to hear from the residents if they choose to come next Tuesday night. Uh, Director Fortson, you're recognized, please. Uh, no question, Mayor. I just wanted to make an introduction, if permissible, in a moment. Okay. You want to go ahead and do that now? I think. Yes, if that, if that's uh, permissible. Yes. I when I read the Tony, proclamation. Tony, stand aside for just a moment, please. Read the proclamation earlier. Mr. Alakinez had been tied up. Traffic was unable to get here. As I mentioned, he is executive chef at the Clinton Presidential Center, and prior to that was executive chef at the Governor's Mansion, and is recognized as a leader in the Hispanic and restaurant industries in this city, and was here to receive the proclamation I read, and we're glad you're here and recognizing your contributions to this city. Mr. Gilbert Alakinez. I've eaten recently at uh, Cafe 42, and it's uh, it's really excellent under your direction. So uh, I would encourage everyone to to take a break, and uh, there's a great Sunday brunch there too. Is that right? Um, we only do brunches now on Easter and Mother's Day. Oh, so we're, we're working on bringing. Back well, I was there brunch. during the day. During it was I went there on a brunch, but I thought there was a brunch. But no, no. We, we we discontinued. That okay, bit, well, I'd encourage everybody to go there during the week. Then, thank you. 
Uh, Director Wright, you're recognized, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like a presentation on number 12. Mr. Brzezinski. Director Wright, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Board Members, Item 12 is property located at the northwest corner of West 38 and Holt Street. The request before you is to rezone the property from R2 single family uh, to plan development residential to allow uh, two duplexes. There are currently two platted lots that make up this site and the proposal is to construct one duplex per lot. The, um, this uh, was not on the consent agenda. There was some opposition at the Planning Commission meeting, but after hearing the opposition and the applicant, the Planning Com Commission voted 10 ayes, zero noes to recommend approval to this body of the proposed development and rezoning. Um, the lots are uh, larger than um, your typical single family lot. Uh, R4, which is our two family duplex zoning, requires a minimum of 7,000 square feet, and the, both these lots exceed that. But again, it's not an R4 zoning before you, it's a planned development. So, the site plan that's in front of you is how the property will be developed. Uh, there's adequate setbacks, there's um, a lot of yard area associated with each lot, there's a, um, adequate parking, they're not overbuilding the, the sites, and again the Planning Commission recommended approval and staff is in support of the proposed rezoning. Okay, Mr. Moore and my fellow colleagues, my concern is that we've already had to place one of Mr. Phillips' duplexes under criminal abatement and uh, he continues to build and build and build. And people are growing concerned, I'm growing concerned, and there has been opposition to this. I've received some calls from the people that live on Holt Street that they are opposed to this. So um, I would like this to be kept separate in case they want to come and voice their opinion to this board. But I am concerned because Mr. Phillips has lost control of one of his properties. And whenever this kind of thing happens, it has a detrimental effect on single family homes that surround it. And uh, it takes a lot to get it under criminal abatement. I think you all know that. It takes a lot. That means there have to be a lot of disturbances, a lot of police calls, and that kind of thing. So I have, I have reservations about allowing him to continue these just all over the place like this because he has not been able to control this particular one. And I attended the John Barron Neighborhood Association meeting uh, a couple of night, a couple of Mondays ago, and they're still saying they're having problems with the one that we do have under criminal abatement. And uh, he has been responsive, but he has not corrected the problem. So I would like this to remain separate, and at this time I have some severe concerns about it. Uh, Tom, if you maybe for um, our meeting have an update on that aspect of this issue. And what is the character of the neighborhood around there, uh, Tony? Um, if we can go to the zoning map. In the immediate vicinity, it's um, either vacant lots or single family. On the north side of 36, uh, west of Lehigh Drive, there's a multifamily development. And then also on uh, the west side of Foster Street, about two properties south of West 36, there's a multifamily development. And then along 36, I, I, it was difficult to tell whether it was still open, but there's a non-residential building. I think it used to be a little neighborhood grocery store. But again, I couldn't tell if it was open or not. It's not. So again, it's... Um, they're single family, but you do have some non-single family uses in the area. And Mayor, the property right. on Foster Thank Street, those multifamilies there are also under criminal abatement. 
Director Hancock, you're recognized, please. Item 12, please. On at, item 12? Uh, that's, that's the one we just discussed. Uh, I'm sorry, 13. 13. At Southwest Ups the other night, uh, the new people who are the president of the Neighborhood Association, Crystal Valley, said that they had not been receiving anything from you all. And also the people from Plantation Acres, part of Plantation Acres, I believe, is in the city and part of it is not in the city. Uh, we had suggested that they call you and also call Mr. Turner and give you the names of the new presidents of both of those associations so they could receive notice. I would appreciate if you would let the people from the um, Crystal Valley know that this is on the agenda for next week. Uh, okay, but um, I don't know if it was the president or a representative. She was at the planning commission meeting. And then I talked to her prior to the planning commission meeting, and she told me that she was the new president or had been president for a couple years. And then Donna talked to her, Donna James talked to her in the last day or two, and um, she said that the person that we have on our list is still the president. So we were kind of getting some mixed. Well, Annette Ricker is the president that we are working with at Southwest Ups. Well, that's who I spoke to, and that's who I think Donna talked to. Okay, and she does know this is on the agenda. Well, I'll, uh, she was at the planning commission meeting. So, okay. but from what she told me prior to the planning commission meeting, that Crystal Valley was in support of this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. We can um, we can now move on to our separate items. Fifteen. And 16 and 17. Uh, Scott, do you have the uh, houses on item uh, 15, please, that you could show us? Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, Director Hendricks, you're recognized, please. I wanted to ask the 2201 Denison. Oh, somebody needs to come up there and tell me about that. Mr. Garland. Excuse me, Mayor, members of the board, Director Hendricks. Ed, 2201 Denison, how long has that been on the list for whatever? I thought that was the dean. It was declared unsafe vacant, Director Hendricks, January 26, 2012. Okay, and then the last one, the one that was real crumbling. 2521 Wolf? Yeah. 2521 Wolf, Director Hendricks was... Uh, no, the other one. The, it must be the last one. It's real, real bad and behind bushes or something. Not that one. Uh, 2521? Uh-uh. Keep flipping them. Tell them to keep flipping them. <coughs> the, the last one was 2521 Wolf. Turn this one around. Think. No, that's not mine. That's not mine. But it was one that was in Ward 1. That looked real bad. Let me see 2401 Vance in the back. 2401 Vance? Yeah, what does it look like in the back? Can you switch it? Ugh. 
Okay, thank you, Ed. Sorry. The, the comment that I have, why do we have to let these houses look like this before they're demolished? I know, not you. No, I'm not talking to you. Thank you. Mr. Moore, when we look at these properties, I have to say there is nothing that looks like this in the West. Why do we have to tolerate all of this stuff? Dr. Hendricks, I sent you all a memo um, not too long ago um, that showed uh, demolitions by ward mm -hmm. over the last five years. Mm -hmm. Ward one, I, I don't have it in front of me, but 80% of the uh, houses that we have brought forward in the last five years have been in your ward. That's not, and, that's not my question. Well, but Come on, the question is how, it, one, it, and Tom has talked about this before, you know, uh, a lot of it's title work that we have to do. Uh, we, we move as aggressively as uh, we can. Now, I'll be honest, uh, these are, you know, we put in a new system probably three or four years ago because what was happening was we bring them for the board and they come up here and they say, oh, I'm, I've got the finances and I need 90 days. You're going to have another one next at our next board meeting. We gave them more time and they haven't done anything. You so it, 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 it's, a, it's a challenge for us in, in some ways, but we, we try to work with the message that I've said to our team is try to work with them. Uh, give them opportunities, uh, but at some point that we un they're just not going to they're not doing anything. Okay. And I wouldn't be surprised if you know, uh, there's somebody down here next Tuesday saying I I want to come in and rehab the structure. Well, I think that this is where I've said for many many years is that we need to change the ordinance. It's not you. You're not causing the problem. It's this ordinance, this age old ordinance that we're operating from. <laughs> so, Tom, I guess we'll get to you. It's not you, Bruce. It's an ordinance, and we sit up here, 8, 9, 10, 11 of us, and we need to do something about it. So I will be, again, for about the fifth time, um, getting with Tom to see if we can come up with a new ordinance. It just doesn't make sense. And again, you would not see this many houses. You wouldn't even see one or two West Little Rock. And I'm going to say it as long as I'm sitting here, because it's the truth. Anybody want to challenge that, come on down front. Well, I believe there. I believe that memo that Bruce sent to us had, um, I think, in Ward One, it was something like 576 um, properties. Um, and you know, I guess the dialogue is really twofold. Uh, and we have continually increased the amount of money that we've put in the budget for demolition. Um, and the demo, you know, the you know, the cost of tearing these properties down is just one element to it. The other element is uh, obviously having the staff to do the title work and make sure that the due process rights of people who own property are, are at least recognized. Uh, and so uh, we're going to have a, a budget discussion coming up here at the end of the month, and we can talk about that in more, in more directly. Uh, but uh, those are the two issues that really stem uh, uh, from how we, how we focus on this. And I, I will, uh, you know, there's always more that can be done, no question about that, Director Hendricks, but we certainly have given this a priority. Uh, in the past that is much greater than what it used to be. So, uh, and I've, I've pushed for more money in this in this area of our budget and uh, will continue to do so. Final, well, am I on? Actually, you are. Okay, thank you. Um, the thing that I had mentioned some time ago is that if the program that I managed for HUD back in the 90s, it's where we would put these houses on auction Put them up and so that give a person so many years or months to restore these houses. And I don't see where that would be a cost to us. And some of these houses, you just can't restore them when you're ready to take a look at them. Well, you'll notice on one of these, and I don't know, I just noticed it on one of them, it had an $800, $815 worth of liens on it already. Um, you know, I don't know how long those liens have been on that property, but, uh, you know, one of the objectives that I've hoped to see is that we would go in and before those houses are so... Um, uh, uh, in such disrepair that they cannot be repaired, uh, that we go in and acquire title to them by f foreclosing on those liens. And so uh, I hope we can have that discussion again about being more aggressive about yeah. when we have, you know, uh, 
grass cutting liens and we've got a variety of other kind of liens on these properties we go in and and, and try and um, acquire those properties that still have the ability to be repaired and and then make them available to people to go ahead and and, and homestead them I mean that that can happen with many of these properties and it's just that a lot of times by the time they get to us they're so far gone there's really nothing else that can be done but to tear them down so mayor I just want to point out one of our challenges this is a an address is actually in ward three uh that i got a picture of today we cleaned this property up last week gave them notice still out there go back to those we cleaned it up and this is what's out there today we we gave them a no, another notice they got until thursday to clean it up but we issue citation, there's a gap to get into court, and this sits there, and then Director Webb's phone keeps going off, and my, I mean, this, I mean, this is a prime example. I mean, this just happens to be something I got today, but, I mean, it, it, is, it is very challenging, uh, and we, I mean, we tried a lot of options. We've sat down with Judge Leverett. Um, often, but I, I just wanted to, and because it, it's this, it's their staff that has to deal with it, and I mean, totally cleaned it up last week. That's what's back out there. Today. <coughs> okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Director Wright, you're recognized, please. Mayor, on this same subject, it seems to me that this is more of a legal issue for our legal department than it is for Mr. Moore. He has the uh, policy in place and. The staff is working this stuff diligently, and if we are if, we've, if we have liens on these properties, then it's up to our legal department to pursue it. So I know how Director Hendricks uh, has, has had to deal with this, but this is more of a legal department matter, well, the way I see it. You also have a major policy issue there. First off, the reason we don't just give them a ticket and have to give them a notice and a citation is not because of our ordinance, but because of state statute. And it's a statute that we tried to get changed a couple of years ago and got no success with it, or a couple of sessions ago. So, so that's one issue. A second issue is that some of these properties have liens upon them not only to the local government for cutting grass, but to the federal government for not paying taxes to the state government for not paying child support and a whole variety of other things, those liens are superior to ours. So if we foreclosed on the liens, all that would happen is, is that one of them would come in and bid the amount of their lien, which is superior, and we would now have no liens. Uh, so then we have to look at the question of what, how do we want to do the resources? And that's not a legal issue, that's a policy issue. Because it's what, about $300 for an adequate uh, title search just to see where we're going to go and then once we get the title search and find out what else is out there how much are we wanting to deal with it if we've got a property that's in really bad shape like you mentioned but it's going to cost us $25,000 going to the federal government to be able to get a $5,000 lot to be able to demolish this do we wish to do that if the answer to that question is yes and the money's there our job becomes easy we just go in and outbid the highest lien but if the money's not there, then we've got to pick and choose. And that's the policy question for y'all. Mr. Moore, the um, program that we are looking at implementing for the city and the foreclosure program, will that assist in any way in this process? It, it will. This is the program on, that focuses on foreclosed property by banks. Uh, that, uh, and we uh, brought them in, and I think we had a good session. So I'm asking our staff to work with Tom's office to craft an ordinance for the board to consider. Okay. But but I don't think that's addressing this issue. It, yeah. No, I mean, it's dealing with foreclosed property. It's dealing with foreclosures. Um, I, I mean, the, the issue is that once we begin to find a house that becomes a problem, it goes from being an acceptable property for occupancy to a problem, and we begin to put, we begin to cite them uh, and spend money. And if we spend money on it, for instance, board and secure is a prime example. We go into a house that's probably still got decent structure, and we board and secure it. And we've had some of those up here for 10, 20, 15, you know, 15 years. Uh, those are the kind of houses that still have some value to them, probably, where we should then do the title work to see whether or not we can get title to it or go in and try and foreclose on our lien. 
those that is a policy issue and and it's just a matter of coordinating our staff with the attorney's office to say these are some houses where it's still a, a house that can be rehabbed and we've got a lien on it that we could foreclose against if we wait forever on it it's going to wind up like the ones we saw today and that's the distinction is where you got to interdict this issue earlier on i mean granted if there's a we find out then whether there's a federal tax lien on it, whether the child support's got a lien on the property. Um, well, oftentimes we find out that, and this is a great opportunity, we find out that banks and other lending institutions um, uh, are holding title to that. I mean, they, they've got a mortgage on that property, and we can go in there and make them clean up the problem. And a lot of times they don't want to clean up the problem. They want to just give it to us and let somebody else try and deal with it. So there's an opportunity if you, if you, if you start to, open up the book early enough to find out whether or not we can do something with these houses. Otherwise, we're going to continue to go on like we do. And we have such a backlog, and we've had that backlog, Director Hendricks, but that's why there's been almost 600 houses in Ward 1 that have over the last five years that we've taken down. I mean, they were too far gone. It's called demo, you know, demolition by neglect. And then there, there's one other problem, and that is, is that if the properties have any kind of federal loans on them we're even limited in what we can do in terms of enforcement of our ordinances because of the preemption doctrine but mayor the the foreclosure program if we can get it implemented will bring in some resources so that we have some money to work Maybe. with so hopefully that will work anyway well the money that we spend right now for board secure our houses where we ought to be looking about what we're putting in in terms of, I mean, those are the ones we ought to be looking at where we want to go ahead and execute against our lien. We, we go in, send them a bill, they don't pay it within a certain period of time, and we ought to go in then and, and we ought to go in and look and do the title work to see whether we should try and acquire that property and get it into the hands of somebody who will take care of the property. That's, that's when that should happen. And we're, I mean, I don't know how much money, we, I think we had a couple hundred thousand dollars on board secure. So, I mean, I think staff should be telling us you know, with the houses that we're using to board and secure, are these properties that uh, we should go ahead and foreclose on our liens on? And that would at least get us started in the right direction on this. Director Hendricks, you're recognized. I, I want to suggest that we need to talk to our legislators. I noticed Tom has mentioned several times it's, it's the law that needs to be changed also. So I will be working, getting in touch with Chesterfield and Blake. They need to get up off of it. Very good. All right. Is there anything, uh, anything else on uh, these items, um, 15, 16, 17? If not, uh, yes, uh, Director Richardson. Thank you, Mayor. I have a question for Tom, Bruce, and possibly you, Mayor. Uh, recently, there have been some published articles about this. Sherwood City Court hot check practices, practices that served as an understanding among cities in Placid County to route all those complaints to Sherwood. And I got a couple of questions, Tom, and maybe you want to chime in, Bruce, um, in the form of some written memo. Under what legal authority does this understanding exist? Is there a statute, a city ordinance? Uh, if we can cite the specific laws, including the date of adoption. The second question is when did we enter into this understanding uh, about the route on the hot checks to Sherwood, can I know, can I find out the specific dates? The, the short uh, answers to your questions are that the I'm objects are criminal offenses and they're handled by the prosecuting attorney and not by our office. So they choose where they're going to be prosecuted. That decision was made long ago. <coughs> there was an attempt by the city to be involved in this process so that local business leaders would not have to go out to Sherwood. And I think that the problems that arose in trying to enforce that, we I think we just finally gave up. I what, know that, that when Harold Bode was the finance director, he had hired an individual whose basic job was to pursue hot checks so that they could be pursued in the Little Rock District Court, and we had a number of serious problems that came about in terms of the prosecution and otherwise when the program ended. So do we or do we not have some kind of legal understanding? Is there a statute? Have control over that. We're not the prosecuting attorney except for what he gives us authority to prosecute that's a state offense. Hot checks are a state offense. The, the 
things that we are given authority to deal with are basically traffic offenses. Uh, DWI is a criminal offense, but we're given, and so we're giving authority over that. But basically, it's traffic offenses. We don't have any other authority than that. So our jobs in the district court for a speeding ticket are because the prosecutor has given us the authority to prosecute those cases. We don't have the authority to prosecute hot checks. So you made reference to Harold Boat, and then, then explain to that how we went to that with Harold Boat here. We passed an ordinance regime to try to deal with it. Uh, I think that one of the things that we found out is that uh, without any space in a jail, there was really no enforcement measure that could get somebody to uh, be inclined to get something paid very quickly. We couldn't get anybody into the Pulaski County Jail. Sherwood had its own jail, and that's what they used. So can we get a copy of that ordinance, Tom? It's and not an ordinance. Oh, you, just said that, ordinance. That, the, you mean the, the prior ordinance on hot checks? Yeah, we can, I'll, I'll try to find yeah. that. There's a bit more dimension to that, Director Richardson. Um, uh, first of all, if, if, a, if a merchant wants to bring a, a hot check warrant to the Little Rock district court they can do that and they'll issue a warrant for their arrest for a hot check uh what's uh, the merchants have found and i can tell you back in my day uh, as prosecutor the merchants have found that sherwood dedicated uh, about somewhere in the vicinity of 12 different people to serve hot check warrants so that they could get the people into court and ultimately try to get restitution on the check our police department uh, and other police departments really did not have, I mean, it was, a va it was a question of evaluating your resource. Do you want your police officers out there serving warrants for hot checks, or do you want them out there patrolling the neighborhood? And so the, the de facto approach to this was is that Sherwood was going to prioritize that, uh, and therefore most merchants understood that, and they took their hot checks out to, um, uh, to uh, Sherwood. Um, when people would come to the prosecutor's office, because they were efficient in the service of those warrants, the prosecutor typically would issue a, a warrant for their arrest, and and then they would take them out to to, uh, to Sherwood to handle. Um, uh, there are not that many checks being written anymore. Um, uh, we had a hot check division when I was prosecutor, and it helped to fund uh, uh, computers in our office when we didn't have any, and a variety of things like that, and um, uh, basically uh, the, the the reduction in the number of hot checks that are being written has really kind of changed the dynamic now. Uh, Sherwood and their fees, which are what really the focus of that art of those articles, uh, have helped to fund the city of Sherwood substantially. And I, I guess when they get into court and discuss all those matters, we'll learn more about that. But uh, that's that's the reason why it's really a merchant-driven and prosecutor-driven decision. So that suggests we don't have the capacity to handle them. If we did, if we if we were if we did handle them, how would this be? Um, how would we handle this, and what what who would assign the hot checks, and to what division of our district courts in Little Rock would it be assigned to? Well, again, the merchants are the ones that go to the prosecutor's office to get the warrants issued for hot checks. So that's the first stop for a merchant. As long as they are efficiently handling them, then they're going to continue to take them where they think they can best get a response. Um, if if uh, if Little Rock is not dedicating a number of warrant police officers, certified police officers as warrant officers, they're going to go to Sherwood because they're going to have a chance to get those warrants served. Whereas, I mean, a hot check warrant in in the priority pecking order is not up there very high in comparison to a lot of other kinds of crimes that are committed where we have police officers dedicated to serving warrants. Sure. Uh, so that's typically what happened, and that's typically why they went there. But again, the merchants are the ones who determine where to go to get the warrant or where to go ahead and have it issued. So if they, if the merchant wants the Little Rock to handle it, then uh, that could, that'll, that'll happen. Now, it will be the P Pulaski County Prosecuting Attorney's Office who they staff the Little Rock District Court Criminal Division. Um, not the, not the traffic division, which Tom and his staff do. So that's the distinction. Well, the last point, Mayor and Tom, do do we have the the capacity and or the authority to um, to look at what the percentages attributed to Little Rock residents and um, dollar amounts of those cases and um, 
collected in five last five years annually in five year totals. Do we have the capacity or authority to collect the kind of information to see how much it, how much of these files are attributed to City of Little Rock residents? I Mayor, suppose we can make too. FOI request to um, Sherwood and go through the checks individually, but I don't I don't know that we could get it in any other way. Well, it would be interesting, I think, to see what kind of impact um, this has had on City of Little Rock residents. So if we had the capacity and or authority, Mayor, I'd like to get that information, and Tom, and also that ordinance you made reference to as well. Okay, thank you, Director Richardson. Director Atkock, did you have something? Yes. Mr. Moore, Mr. Carpenter, we received an email today from a young man who is five years old, and he had some suggestions on our crosswalks. And I would like for Mr. Honeywell to take this and look at it and see if maybe we need to do some of these updates that the young man has talked about, and then to respond back to the young man and his mother on having received this and that he has looked at it, and these are the outcomes of it. Can you read it for us? It says, please, dear city, please replace all the tiny, teeny tiny crosswalk buttons in Little Rock. The little buttons are not good because they do not say wait. When a blind person pushes them and knows not to go right when they push the button, these little buttons don't have a red light and are too old and not easy for blind people to find. I'll feel happy if you fix this because it would be better for the blind people. Love, Kevin O'Connor, age five. P.S. I need more crosswalks. I need a crosswalk at every busy seat, street so I can so I can cross safely. Thank you. So Mr. Moore, I'm going to pass this around because I think that this young person at five, if he's caring about our city, that we need to respond to him. I think all of you received this. Uh, direct, uh, Director Weirich, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Moore, um, National Night Out, I talked with some firefighters. And um, of course, they're aware that MIMS uh, got the uh, bulletproof vest uh, recently. And they made me aware that um, there have been some situations whenever they went to a site that um, there was a live, um, live situation going on where uh, bullets were flying, et cetera. So um, I don't know if the fire chief has thought about bulletproof vests for the firefighters. I don't know if that's been on his agenda or not. Um, but if MIMS thinks it's important for their, um, their drivers and their workers, then we might need to look into um, the firefighters. And I have a question about that. Do the bulletproof vests, do they actually fit them to the individual that's going to wear them? So they're individually made for each person? They're individually sized. Um, so what we do is, and in fact, we were about to, uh, one of your upcoming agendas for the police department, we need to order. They, the bulletproof vests have about a five-year um, uh, lifespan, so uh, we need to... Um, uh, I'm, I'll be coming forward with the, uh, with the ordering. Uh, what I don't know, and I'll check, you know, uh, because the firefighters, if they're going into a, a, a situation where there's a fire, I'm not sure the vest would. Uh, right. Would, no, uh, this so was a live criminal situation with bullets and all that kind of stuff. And apparently they weren't aware that it was active whenever they, when they were there. And usually, uh, including MIMS, um, they are held back, both the fire department and MIMS are held back in any active situation. So I, I'll have to look into that because I'm, they, they usually have a pretty good protocol. Not pretty good. They have a good protocol on that. So I'll, I'll look at the situation. I, the chief has not talked to me about that, uh, but I will follow up. One of the things I was wondering is if you could put the bulletproof vest in the fire apparatus so they would have them available if they needed it as opposed to assigning it to each firefighter because that would be a lot of a lot of vests and maybe not everybody would need them but in the event that there was an active situation they could they could grab them so we'll look at it I mean because again the different sizes and um but we'll we'll look at it. Okay. The other thing I wanted to know is I know Joan uh, has asked about this for some time. 
and it was a new uh, parking and yards uh, ordinance. Um, a lot of people are upset about parking and yards, and I, I, I was under the opinion that Mr. Carpenter was working on a new, a new ordinance for us. That's right. That's, that's a yes. Are we getting close? Because it seems like it's been going on for a lot of months. I think we are. Like next week? Not that close. <laughs> but by the end of the month. This month? Yes. Seriously? Yes, we did. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Director Hines, did you have something on that issue? Yeah, just wanted to, because I serve as liaison to MEMS, part of the reason is, if you'll recall, MEMS covers about a five-county area, so they do not always operate under the same standard operating procedures that they do within the city of Little Rock. So uh, the response was there was an uh, emergency medical responder, I think, that was shot several months ago, and it really kind of put it on the forefront that that was something that if they knew they were going into domestic disturbance where they didn't have police backup as a first responder, they, they would need those. But I, I definitely have to talk to the firefighters, but I, I think they prefer a second set of turnouts over a fire over a bulletproof vest. I know they would, and they're <laughs> happy about getting them, at least some of them getting them. But they did mention to me that um, they were very much interested in bulletproof vests as well. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Director Richardson, did you have anything? Thank you, Mayor. Bruce, um, there seems to be an a uptick in, in uh, violent activities in the central part of our city, and I believe this is related to gang activity. But unlike in the early 90s, it doesn't center around colors. I mean, it centers around retaliatory actions based on financial crimes. And uh, it seems to be uh, the last week or so, they've all been interrelated. They've all been connected to, I think, one specific robbery or robbery attempt. And it's not unlike in the 90s where, you know, we had activities centered around colors and colors. This seemed to be centered around a couple of financial issues that arose and a lot of stuff centered around retaliation based on that. Can we get a report without compromising any of our intelligence from the police department in terms of what we're doing with respect to these activities? And they all seem to be an essential part of the city, mainly in, in Director Hendricks' ward. And I'd like to know uh, what kind of response we're giving to these activities because they seem to be concerning to a lot of people in the center part of the city, and they don't see or know if anything we're doing to address this. Director, uh, I will provide that uh, without you know compromising the investigations. Uh, I feel very confident that Chief Buckner and his team are on top of it, and and we'll get. I, I, I agree with you on sort of the uh, the basis of them, but uh, I feel. Very confident that uh, we we the direction we're going in, but I'll get your report. I appreciate it. I think I sent you and and Chief Budden some information on some of the intelligence I got around a couple of those activities, and I think if we don't aggressively move forward on them, we can look and expect to see in the next week or so some more activities centered around a, a couple of a couple of issues. So I appreciate that, yeah, Director Richardson. I know we've had we've had some meetings on it. So thank you, man. Thanks, we'll, we'll get we'll get the uh, get uh, the chief to get a, an update relative to that. But I can tell you they're very much aware of what's going on with the plan. Okay, um, that concludes everything that's on our agenda. Thank you all very much for being here.